detail. Turns out all the detail already been there. All you have to do, itemize it, show it, do the snapshot to demonstrate you're here to stay. Because what's important is that if you're here to stay, your patient will stay with you and the primary care will be strong. Just like before. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Lewis Friedlander, and uh, he'll present uh, methods of diagnosis and treatment of ophthalmic artery stenosis and anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Dr. Friedlander has been in practice, practicing plastic surgery in Atlanta, Georgia since 1995. He'll review findings of a report which examined the potential correlations between patients with ischemic central retinal vein occlusion syndromes and significant narrowing of the ophthalmic arteries. They'll also discuss a new technique which may offer salvage for otherwise untreatable vascular disease causing blindness. Dr. Friedlander. Thank you. This is a work that started a long time ago. I did a um, orbital fellowship after a general surgery and then I did a neurosurgery fellowship because I got interested in some of these people that were coming to the clinic that had uh, uh, poor vision along with other carotid disease, and I would start to go to the uh, uh, neurosurgeon or the vascular surgeon and talk about the uh, relationship, and they really didn't have much interest in going there, which was really the orbit. And then same with the ophthalmologist. They, they, were, they didn't really pay too much interest or thought that it was the other job or the other guy's job to look at the orbital vessels, so that this whole thing started because I could see that there was sort of a void or a gap. Um, I changed the talk from anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is the same, which, which is the same principle to this ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, another common disorder in elderly, because we're about to present the AA or, or submit the AON for publication and we didn't want any conflict. So uh, other than that, I, um, let's see. I, I, I have uh, disclosure owning the patent for the technique I developed to use the measurement of choroidal blood flow. And I'll explain why we created that or I created that, but um, that's a patent. Otherwise, there is no uh, other disclosure. So we're looking at basically what is a common cause of visual loss and only second to diabetes in elderly patients in the fundus, the retina which is um, central retinal vein occlusion. Nobody ever has really um, given any uh, positive definitive pathology for the explanation why it occurs. And again, we started seeing a pattern that these patients also had cerebral vascular disease, including the orbit, uh, that nobody had explained. So the, the hypothesis was that there may be a direct link between these two entities, the main occlusive syndrome, which is really not going to be which probably is not vein occlusion per se, it's vein sludging based on arterial lack of inflow. And then we also want to see if we could predict which patients had poor flow based on a minimally invasive technique using endocyanine green um, and injecting it, which is already in place in ophthalmology and has been for a long time. Uh, but we, we uh, modified it to, to measure the flow if you inject it into the vein as it goes through the carotid and it goes through the retina and creates a um, flow, the, a flow, a pattern that you can identify as normal or abnormal. We'll show that too. Um, we you, ended up studying, and they're not easy to categorize and get a hold of and actually study. So we were lucky in the two-year fellowship to get nine that we compared a number of things to, including non-invasive standard stuff, fluorescein CT, um, and then in actually one patient that was losing vision, had lost vision in one eye, was losing a vision in the other. They came to us and asked if we would consider operating on this patient, and we'll discuss what we did, which was the creation of a um, bypass from the um, superficial temporal artery to the branch of the ophthalmic, bypassing a proximal orbital ophthalmic lesion, and I will show you what this is about. This is the whole emphasis of the study. 
Um, the rest of the test, as far as what the ophthalmologist, and I, and I say ophthalmologist because I work with them some, but they're very diligent at getting the proper studies, but it really didn't, didn't bear out much to help uh, elucidate the problem as far as we could tell, and we'll show that too. So the non-invasives were really not helpful. Um, but in the, using BFR, which is the technique I described, to, and I'll show you that, that um, all of them had abnormalities of flow in the choroid circulation. Well, there's the retina, and then behind is the choroid, and the choroid had poor perfusion. Um, and then we, as we discussed in this one patient, we did this uh, revascularization, which I'll explain. Um, and we, we, and we, we, again, said that there's probably way more ophthalmic artery disease, which is totally unrelated or up to this point to central retinal vein inclusion and some of these disorders, which I'll describe further. So this is, you're seeing stuff probably more than anybody has seen cases of these before. Um, central retinal vein inclusion, how many ophthalmologists do we have here? There's one. So, you know, you look in the fundus and you see hemorrhages in all quadrants and you see some cotton wool spots and they also have other, but, but, but it's a, it's a, for, an, for a non ophthalmologist, you know, it's a frightening looking thing and it is bad. It's a, Terrible ischemic visual loss, and they they've defined it now in ischemic and non-ischemic, but I think they're a continuation of each other. So bad-looking retina, the only thing you know to do is send it to ophthalmology, and that's that's what we do, appropriately. So, so um, the defects are usually permanent, and of course, depending on the visual loss when you first examine them, that has a high prognostic factor. If they've lost a lot of vision right off, which is the ones that we were seeing they're not usually going to regain much vision. Some cases can be prolonged, and we think that that is a window of opportunity. And again, no definite pathology. They've never proved why this happens. It, um, the measurement of choroidal flow um, is it's a highly complicated issue, but it's sort of the whole plexus of vessels behind the retina, and it's a sort of a flow through. It's either got good perfusion or it doesn't that the retina has some compensatory mechanisms, so we focused on trying to assess choroidal flow, um, but it, it actually produces a flow curve. You can look at the arrival, the peak, the filling, all the characteristics that um, you learn to measure as, you know, for a uh, simple vascular. So, so the um, initiation point here is the, where we inject it into the antibrachial vein, a bolus of dye, and as it goes through, there's an arrival time, a filling curve, a filling um, um, slope, peak, and then a runoff, and then even a recirculation. So that's in an idea young person. We actually did 300 of these at Emory. So that, that's normal. We gained a lot of experience by doing patients that were having carotid surgery. So we'd measure their flows before the surgery. We'd know how much carotid stenosis they had in the, based on angiography. And then the surgeons would open it. We'd get a even further idea, and then that when it was open, then we'd repeat the study. So we, we really knew what was normal, what was abnormal, what was the extent of um, stenosis. So that was helpful. Just reiterating how we gained it. Um, again, this vein occlusion syndrome, which I'm going to show you, has never been connected directly with um, arterial inflow, carotid inflow, or orbital problems. Um, this, this focus is on looking at the ophthalmic artery in the orbit, which is old literature and not much new literature, because again, nobody's paid attention. So you have to look at the details of it to say, just seeing an ophthalmic artery doesn't make it normal. So I'll show you a lot of examples of not normal, but I'm first gonna show you an example of normal. So this is right at the carotid comes up into the neck, intra, intracranial portion, the first big branch is the ophthalmic artery. It goes out, and then it gives ciliary arteries, which is the smaller branches. And then you can see a choroid blush, like the um, back of the retina. That's that's the behind the fundus. There's multiple arrows, and then the other smaller arrows show the branches. All those branches have to be there. I mean, that's a normal. So, again, unless you read radiologic literature, they just usually see a big branch and they go, "It's okay." So, because nobody's paying attention, and in correlated. Um, so in these patients, they're having apoplectic visual, sudden and progressive, or sudden and stable, but they've lost vision. Some of them, some of them have 
a little pain. Some of them have redness. They have um, afferent pupil defects. So there's the um, optic nerve head is also affected. So they're 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 straightforward classifications, but they have to have the whole all of the eye, not just part with blood and thunder or the blood and hemorrhage. Um, the, the, the hypothesis is that we saw, I saw, a common place where the ophthalmic artery was narrowed. It was at the very beginning. And those branches that I showed you come off past there. And I felt like it's pretty small, but if we could connect an inflow to them past the, the usual point of occlusion in the right setting, because it was technically possible by the time we were doing these, by the um, microsurgical technology it had gotten to that point, which was about a millimeter or less. And um, it could be done, and you could improve the flow. That would be the possible hope of improving the retinal circulation. So that, that's what this is all about. So this this is sort of the um, idea. There's there's the external parotid, internal parotid. The internal parotid goes in a couple of smaller branches, and there's the big ophthalmic artery. It goes into the orbit in the orbital fissure, and there is the branch, that, uh, that's the part of the artery that's usually occluded where it says site of occlusion. And then there's the branches past it. So by taking one of the branches of the external parotid, the superficial temporal artery, and, and freeing it up and bringing it down into the orbit through techniques which I'll show you, that we created an anastomosis, an end-to-end -end microvascular anastomosis. And the flow um, is technically possible to do it, and we've done it, and I've actually done it recently again. And, and then if, if all the other stuff is right, meaning that's the cause of the problem, the, the improvement in circulation in the retina should be manifested by improvement in visual function. Um, so we measured in the pet cases that we did, repeated the angiography, the visual fields, the visual acuity, and, and, and we showed some other things that in two cases we had patients that had the opposite eye that we operated and also affected for a long time. And surprisingly, in some of those cases, they had the other eye improved that was not operated on. Well, why? Because the ciliary branches that connect between the um, uh, nasal um, artery, the, 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 na the nasal artery, basically, and the ethmoidal artery cross through and provided fill improved filling to the opposite ophthalmic artery, which was a gift in these people's cases. Um, again, it became apparent that this is something that seemed to, we'd look and we'd find it. And it wasn't ever a case where we looked and didn't find it. Because if you showed us these cases and we worked them up and we've got an arteriogram, which I'll show you, it was there. The, the problem was there in these cases. Now, can you say that definitely is the cause of the vein occlusive syndrome? No, but we'll go on. I'll show you. So there again is our, our is our the BFR, which is contact lenses on both eyes. The fiber optics allows the light to be projected, and the reflection of the light changes as the dye passes through the circulation. It changes according to how much the volume of dye is. So there's this, a normal and there's an abnormal. So this is we use this to help us correlate flow. I'll quickly show. So this is an abnormal case. The, the lower one's going through pretty quick. The, Upper one's blunted and slow, and we, we developed a lot of, learned a lot of stuff as we did these, because we saw it on people where we knew the vessel size, and now we saw it before we knew the vessel size, and we could tell there were differences, and we could say this is a real, you know, abnormal flow. So here, I mean, it was actually um, real abnormal. This, this arrow was not put in but the, the, there is no ophthalmic artery. The ophthalmic artery doesn't fill at all. They call that, that's a branch of the anterior cerebral. It didn't fill at all. So in that case, the lady just had that flow where I showed you. We got an arteriogram. The guy said, well, it looks, the ophthalmic artery looks okay. It wasn't even there. So that's that's a case. It's another case similar. The lower curve flow is nice. has the normal parameters. The upper flow is just sort of static. has no response to the dye going through. You don't see it because there's not much dye going through. And there's the ophthalmic artery it comes to an abrupt end, and there is no filling of small vessels, and there's no choroidal blush, so totally abnormal. And again, they call that normal ophthalmic filling. And when, they, when we showed it to them, they said, yeah, they agree. One question. Yeah, go ahead. 
that time the fish were, were they blind? Or well, what? Significantly decreased vision. Hand motion, light perception, 2400, those levels. In what period of time by the time they... Well, we were, we've got them within a week or their presentation or more, okay. even sometimes within a couple of days. They, again, some of them had sort of progressive visual loss, some of them had sudden and stable, at poor vision. So it, it depends, but very poor. We got the worst ones because we said that's what we were looking for. So we had the worst of the crop. What is, what is the corrective dash? Is it arterial or venous? No, that's, that's arterial. So that's just arterial. Yeah, arterial. So again, you should see that little curve here within within one second to 1.5 seconds of it arriving at the carotid site but, and it should be there before the intracranial fill and I'll show you sometimes it's so slow we wait until the venous phase occurs in the in the cerebral circulation and then you see a little bit of choroid blush but very slow it's abnormal here is an ophthalmic artery that has big problems no branches, even if this is a loop, which is all, which is always a bad thing, comes to an end. No forward blush and no small branches. That was another example. I'm, I'm showing you these quickly. You can assume that these are patients that had um, very complicated problems. Tortuosity of all retinal veins, diffuse venous hemorrhages, severe ischemic central retinal vein occlusion, poor vision, hand motion only. Very, very poor flows on both that. Maybe the lower curve, which is the left one, had better. The right one slowly blows up, but there's no runoff. Poor circulation. Here again, <coughs> it, it stops here. No choroid blush, no small vessels, abnormal. Uh, I won't hammer the details of these patients, but again, all very poor presentation. We had one, this is the one that had both eyes bad, no, no flow through either eye. He had exist, pre-existing central retinal vein occlusion syndrome and diabetes in the other eye, and now his only good eye was going bad, so they asked if we would look at operating on him. <coughs> That's the other side. Both sides, can we go back one second? Let's not go back. Can you go back one? Yeah, so, okay, let's look at this. Like like the like the a diagram shows right at the beginning there's there's narrowing no flow through there very poor flow there no, almost no branch and no cor no coral blush all bad same on his other eye the big branch goes through very few filling and no coral blush so all bad and again nobody's paid any attention to this until this day or, or, or when we looked at it first so here we go bad flow. So here's the operation. Here was here was our idea, or mine, we, and I got the neurosurgeon to help me, so they were excited. This is a coronal flap. Guy lies on the back. You um, open the these are little rainy clips, and you leave the periosteum on. This is above periosteum, below galium. And when you turn this flap over, it's not quite that nice, but you're you're using a Doppler, and you're finding the superficial temporal artery, which is a branch of the external carotid circulation. So it goes like this, you can feel it. You can feel it. And what you do is you stretch, you, you basically take it as far as you can dissect it out, and you hope that you're going to get it when it goes up in here normally, to, to come down and, and be released and come to, this is a branch of the supraorbital artery coming out of the orbit. So that's what I, that's my attack site, that's the one I'm trying to hook to. So it's again not that easy to find the superorbital either. Here, here's so here's the vessel dissected out as far as we could get it. Here you're looking down on the head and the eye is up here, and you release the periorbitum, and that little superorbital branch is coming out. You have to drill around where it comes out to, to create enough space to to release it. It's, it's sort of like a little well, superorbital the um, groove the the uh, superorbital groove and the supratrochlear groove are two little holes are sort of fibrous and you, you they can be taken down. I did a bunch of these in the anatomy lab to teach myself how to get to this thing. So then you go into the orbit up on the roof and you're looking at the superorbital artery and you um, free that up from the inside and then you create an end-to-end -end anastomosis. Which is what you want to get 
because it, because after, after it goes through the little foramen, it, it narrows down. So you, if you get before the foramen, it's, it's wider. It's just natural. So you want to get the anastomosis just inside the orbit, where the, the two sizes, one millimeter, are close to each other. So this is after the anastomosis. Now all of a sudden, where you had no flow, the affected side has a good, nice curve. And that's real. The other side had a pretty good little, it was later, but it received obviously better flow than the flat line you saw on the um, pre-op. So we didn't pay attention until after the surgery, and then the patient reported an enormous improvement in the affected eye, and we said, I can even see better on my other eye. And he got measured, he went from 2400 or hand motion to functional, 2070, 20, I mean, you could see some details. So, this was as bad, the, the other eye that had not been operated, the, other, the good eye had dramatic improvement in visual field, dramatic improvement in um, uh, visual acuity, and sustain for a year. There's the pre-op. That, the, that was the affected eye, or the operated eye, pre-op. The bad eye, the eye that had not been, he was already a lost vision. And this is the pre-op field, post-op field for anybody that's the ophthalmology. And again, the visual acuities in both sides have dramatically improved. So, this is a picture of blood and thunder and all, you know, you look at that, you go, oh my God, you're not, you're not an ophthalmologist, I'm not. But, um, so what I'm about to show you has never been seen this sequence before. So this is post-op, or pre-op the first day, or pre-op the day of surgery before, or right before he'd gotten this, um, Fund his photography, and then two days after surgery, two days after surgery. So th that's real. That's never been reported. Um, but that that now this is the other op. So no minimal blood. Um, much better. That's the affected side. Pre-op looks bad. They've done laser again. The diabetes. Those are those little white marks. They stay. Much clearing of the blood, almost dramatic. The, the, the little laser marks are in the same orientation, but now you can see the um, vasculature in its normal pattern because much of the blood is already resorbed that quick within a couple of days. This is another case. Some difference in the flows, but a big bad look. So again, and this will be the same thing over and over purposely being repetitious because again that nobody's appreciated this so no agoric blush no minimal fine vessels just so again most people when they read it first they say they have found the card it reads okay they're just doing their job but they're really not studying it even macular edema was improved in one case another abnormal BFR flow and almost a dead occlusion right up the inter there's the carotid side and there's the ophthalmic artery and right past that point it just stops. There's no fine small vessels, there's no choroid blush, but this is one that they say if they see the ophthalmic artery where the arrow is, they don't go much past there and describing it. Did you mention uh, did any of these cases have microdenial Macular edema is a little bit okay. different, but that's that's on the road to macular degeneration. This is a carotid case, and and he this patient had been losing vision along with TIAs. When they corrected the carotid, we looked at the but the vision didn't improve. It. And here's the here's the ophthalmic artery, and here's a blow up of it, and it just never got better. And that's because he has ophthalmic disease. And even though they improved the carotid filling and the carotid defect, the, the vision kept going down after the carotid endarterectomy, and this is why. You, you're never, you're never going to get past that obstruction. So is this atherosclerotic obstruction? Is, is it what? Is it atherosclerotic obstruction? It probably, it's probably the same problem. I mean, it's, it's the exact same thing on the other side of the intracranial carotid where the middle cerebrals and the this, these are pre-stroke vessels, stroke vessels, I mean, yes, narrowing, gradual occlusion, probably, I can't say, I haven't opened them up and looked at the pathology, but this is the same. What's the damage of the 
What's the what? What's the diameter? Well, at the beginning, at, right when it comes to the, um, when it comes up to carotid and goes to, here's the orbit yeah. and the orbital fissures here, it's probably about two and a half millimeters when you start and then goes down, like I said, it's the or superorbital, which is a branch of about a millimeter or less. But the middle, mid portion of the bayonet, they call it, is about millimeter and a half something so this, these are operable vessels this is not microvascular this is this if you can see it you can operate them. Can you strengthen them? say again can you strengthen those? Can you strengthen? I, yeah i think you can nobody's ever done it. but but i mean i think that's that's the next step yeah i mean that would sort of take away this deal but but at the same time that would be pretty good but they, you'd have to understand the ophthalmic artery, you'd have to, you, you, you'd have to, I mean, again, nobody, even if you show all these pictures to people, they're saying, well, you haven't proved that it's caused that. And you're right, I haven't proved it. This is a handful of cases, but I'm showing you what I got, and this, this, this is where we're starting. Um, we're trying, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's just like everything, slow going. Fast. Sometimes you have to, this is fast flow, pretty good, and it starts coming down. This thing just slowly accumulating dye and doesn't, doesn't run off. My, so you have to sort of lean, learn to read these. And I hope that this will become part of, you know, ophthalmology someday as far as this. They've used endocyanin green, but not in this context. Endocyanin green is used to measure lung flow, liver flow, some other areas. And they use these curves similarly to assess the path of flow through or wash through a perfusion. So this is not a deep concept. Go back to the stick question, the stick question. The, the smallest stick is still a little bit different. Is it? I don't know. No, I, I, I was supposed to, I asked the question. I don't know, I don't know the, the, how, I think it may be a little smaller. The problem, now they stand carotids now, so that's known. Okay, but what about them? No, well, no, no one has ever done that. Again, no one has ever done it. Oh, why is that? Because they've never. Because again, nobody's made the, said we agree that the narrowing of the ophthalmic artery leads to central vein occlusion. By the way, um, here's the other entities, and I have more cases of those. But slowly, here's here's what all else it causes, I believe, and I have cases to prove. Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which was, I was going to talk about originally, but I want to help till it was published. Low tension glaucoma, normal tension glaucoma. So I know you guys in the ophthalmology world care about that. And that has been connected with low flow, but nobody's proved it. Macular edema, macular degeneration is yes. Posterior ischemic optic neuropathy and ischemic optic So th those entities have been, I've shown, that had a similar... This is the most number of ophthalmic artery occlusions ever presented, ever put together on any series anywhere in history. So, and each one of these papers I'm just putting together have a similar number. And so you can look at them and discuss them with whoever your neuroradiologist is. And I think in the end, it's undeniable that they're there. The question is, do they cause this disease? And I, you know, I'm at the, at the beginning saying, I think it does, but that's my position. How many patients were there, Dr. Friedlander? Uh, in this series or nine? This series, nine? Nine patients. All right, I think we're going to have to pretty much cut it off now. And, uh, Sounds good. Um, and thank you very much. And uh, yeah. thank you very much. So, it's an exciting area. The, um, um, at, at this point, uh, we've got a break, right? right. And, uh, so. so the break will be. Be sure if you haven't signed. Uh, in for today, you know, do that. You only have to sign once, and, and then uh, the sign out. And uh, be sure to keep up with your uh, CME. Uh, if there's additional questions, certainly come up and ask. And for Dr. Chow and Dr. Barnes.